Welcome back to the Seaboard Central, everyone, and part three of the Realistic Ops series. In part one, we talked about the method of operation, and in part two, we talked about developing an operating plan. And in part three, we're going to talk about car forwarding and car distribution. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep watching. And this video is going to be filled with a lot of prototype information, so you may want to grab a pen and a piece of paper and take some notes. If you like this video, as always, I appreciate a thumbs up. So without further ado, let's get started. What you're looking at here, folks, is an actual prototype waybill. And I'll show you some interesting things that and how you read a waybill. So at the very top, you see the originated carrier. In this case, it was Kansas City Southern, and this was where the car originated on. Each railroad has their own unique number, and for KCS, the number is 400. Next up, you'll see the actual car number. It's a GATX 4029. Right beside it will be the AAR car type. In this case, is a T106. Right below it is the letter T. That's the mechanical designation code. Now over here on the right, you'll see how long the car is. This one's 55 feet, 5 inches long. Next up, the next line, you'll show the destination station. And here's the destination station number. The actual destination station is Anderson, South Carolina, and this will be going to the Pickens Railroad. And there's the short line. It's in the parentheses, so it'll be interchanged to a short line. Right beside it is the originating station. Here's the originated station's number. Came out of Princeton, Louisiana. Below the uh, destination station, you have the route. This is the routing the car will take to get to where it's going. And it originated on the KCS, and in New Orleans, it's interchanged to Norfolk Southern. You'll note that in this route, the short line is not included. That's because the short line does not, uh, it's not included in the line haul revenue way bill. This is a line haul revenue way bill. The short line will only get a switch uh, a switch move out of it. So they'll just get a, a fee for switching the car at their interchange to the final destination. All right, and that final destination is where this car is going is uh, a Michelin plant in um, Anderson, South Carolina on the Pickens Railroad. Below here, below the uh, originating location where the uh, car was loaded at in Princeton, Louisiana, this refining company, shows the shipper. This is who's paying the bill to, unless it's uh, unless it's some other circumstance where the receiver pays it, the shipper always pays the loaded moves. So this is who is paying paying for this move to get to where it's going. Down here, you'll see the uh, contents that's in the car. This is a one carload of petroleum lubricating oil. And that's basically the rest of the way bill, other than it shows the weight of the car. It'll show the actual um, total weight. It'll show the empty weight and the, um, the actual loaded weight in the car. I'll show you one more example. This is one of a car coming off the Union Pacific Railroad, and you'll see their number is 802. In this case, this is a covered hopper. Uh, the car number is PPGX12417, and you'll see the AAR car type is a C114, and the mechanical designation code is a LO. Again, this one is uh, destined for the Pickens Railroad at Anderson, South Carolina. It originated in Westlake, Louisiana, from a company called PPG Industries. It's destined, again, to that Michelin plant in Anderson, South Carolina, and in this case, this is a carload of what they call high seal. And this car uh, looks similar to a plastic pellet car, but I'll show you the difference. Uh, it's, uh, it's a larger car and it's carrying a product used in the tire making process. And uh, the shipper here is PPG Industries and it shows the weight. So we'll look at this particular way, Bill, and we're gonna talk about what's really important for a model railroad perspective. Do we really need all this information? And no, the answer is no, we don't. The main thing that we need to know is the car number and the car type, the routing, and where it's going. Who's receiving the car? All this other information is nice to know. We may want to know what the contents, but in this case, we don't even know what the contents are on the car because it's just a number. 
just shows a number. So what's most important, especially to a train crew, is just where the car is going. Who do we, what is our responsibility for the car on our train? Is it just forwarded it to its uh, next part of its journey or is it actually delivering it to a customer? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. When it comes to a car forwarding, rail cars must follow certain rules, also known as car service directives. And they're different depending on the ownership code of the car. And what you're looking at are three similar looking gondolas, but they each fall under a different ownership code. Now let me explain what I mean by this. So this first car represents ownership code number one. And that's because it is known as a railroad owned car. It's noted by the railroad owned mark, C-O-E-R. That's actual a real railroad. So these have their own set of rules that they follow. This next car falls under ownership code number two, which is known as a TTX car, trailer train car. And the TTX equipment have their own set of rules that they fall under. And finally, this last car falls under ownership code number three. It's a private mark car. And then you note that by the uh, reporting mark in an in X. And private cars have their own set of rules that they must follow. So these car service directive rules govern the cars once they're empty. And they basically instruct whatever the uh, railroad is where the car was terminated and emptied on, know what to do with them on their next move. When it comes to private mark cars, they're pretty simple. Once they're empty, they run reverse route. So whatever the last loaded way bill was for the particular car, the empty way bill should move the car back to where it came from. And this will always be the case unless whoever's leasing the car decides to divert it. And they have certain opportunities when they can divert it to a different location if they choose to, but it's very limited. So most of the cases, especially when it comes to cars carrying specific commodities like chemicals, they will always go back to a specific location to get a load out. Doesn't mean that the loaded way bill will go back to the same destination all the time, but most of the time the empty will move back to one specific spot. When it comes to TTX equipment or trailer train equipment, these cars are actually owned by all the big class one railroads. They're all members of the TTX uh, corporation where they pull cars together. So. You will have uh, CSX, BNSF, Canadian Pacific, Canadian National, Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, all are members of the TTX company. And so each month, TTX itself will actually get on a conference call with each railroad and let them know what the percentage of TTX cars that needs to be on each railroad's property. And those are cars that they can use to load out, uh, send to locations to receive their loads. And they're also, they're just known as national pool cars. So you can uh, run them out. Uh, they're shared by all those big class one railroads. And so once they empty, a car can load out on Norfolk Southern and empty on Union Pacific, and then Union Pacific can turn around and reload the car. So it makes it a lot easier for each one of the big class one railroads to utilize equipment by sharing them this way. When it comes to railroad owned cars, each railroad will have their own distribution team that will handle the empty moves and send the empty cars to where they need to go to get their next load. In the case, uh, when I was working in car management, the last thing I did was manage the covered coil fleet for Norfolk Southern, just like this car here, right, right here. And I put all the covered coils in their own pools, depending on the car type, what kind of car it was. In this case, this was an insulated 100 ton covered coil car that was in a group and a pool that was made up of those types of cars. So customers would go online and uh, order cars for the following week. And it was my job to make sure there was a sufficient number of cars to fill their car orders. So let's look at my national cement industry on the layout. You'll note that every single car here are private mark cars in an X. So these are the cars that are made up of a pool of cars that are always be loaded out at this location. And this is entirely prototypical where a particular shipper has decided to use their own equipment instead of ordering railroad mark cars. 
they chose to have their own private cars. This ensures that they have enough supply of their own car. They don't have to depend on the railroad to supply their cars. These cars will always come back to this location when they're empty to get another load. Now the load can go to different customers for to be unloaded, but the empty move will always direct them right back here. So what does all this mean when it comes to a model railroad? Well, some things are important and some things aren't. I don't need to know everything that's on the way, Bill. My only concern is what to do with a rail car while it's on the Seaboard Central property. This means that for loaded rail cars received an interchange from another railroad, they need to return to that railroad once empty. Can the Seaboard Central send another railroad-owned car or TTX car to a customer on the Seaboard Central to be loaded? Well, in most cases, the answer is no, at least not without permission from that railroad. In most cases, the customer on the Seaboard Central that originates loads will either use their own lease private mark cars or request Seaboard Central rail cars for loading. I hope this makes some kind of sense to you, is how rail cars are moved in the real world and how they'll be moved on the Seaboard Central. So I hope that gave you a little bit more information on how the prototype handles car forwarding. And trust me, we'll get into more detail on that as the Realistic Ops series continues. Next week, we'll do the uh, monthly layout update for the February month of February, and then we'll pick up with Realistic Ops part number four. So be sure to tune back in for that one. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Seaboard Central. And as always, thanks for watching and happy model railroading, everyone.